Good afternoon. My name is Alexandra Wixon, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health updates call on August 2nd, 2023. Next slide. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2023 slash august dot html. Next slide. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for detection of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for responding to public health threats. List two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose that they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is zohu webcast. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash tceo or sorry, tce online by September 4th, 2023. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted on our August website page within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by September 5th, 2025. Next slide. Oh. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Casey Barton Baravesh, Director of the One Health Office, will share some news and updates. Thanks, Alexandra, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our August Zohu call. As always, we appreciate you continuing to spread the word about the Zohu call and share the Zohu call website link with your colleagues from many different sectors, including public health, agriculture, wildlife, plant, environment, and others, so we can let them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continuing education that the Zohu Call offers. Before our presentations start, I want to take just a moment to share some updates and resources, and as always, you can find links to these in today's Zohu Call email newsletter. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed to that newsletter, please sign up using the link at the top of the main Zohu Call email page, and you can get this uh, monthly update from us. So next slide. In today's newsletter, we highlight several recent publications, including transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in free-ranging white-tailed deer in the United States and community impacts after a jet fuel leak contaminated a drinking water system in Hawaii in November 2021. Next slide. We also have additional publications to highlight, including trends in heat-related illness with the nationwide observational cohort at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, and travel-related diagnoses among U.S. non-migrant travelers are migrants presenting to U.S. geosentinel sites through the geosentinel network. Next slide. 
You can also find web resources and announcements, including links to an update about H5N1 bird flu found in domestic cats in Poland, and a new summary report on One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System, or OHABs, in the United States for 2021. Next slide. Additional highlights include the National Wildlife Health Center newsletter and a podcast, Is It Okay to Let a Dog Lick Your Face? An expert from the CDC weighs in. Um, and next slide. We've got some events and observances that might be of interest to you all. There's National Immunization Awareness Month. Also, August 20th is World Mosquito Day. And on September 6th, there's a free workshop on the topic of advancing health equity through antimicrobial stewardship. So we invite you all to please continue to send presenter and topic suggestions for future um, Zohu calls, as well as news from your organizations that you'd like for us to share with our Zohu network to zohucall at cdc.gov. That's Z-O-H-U-C-A-L-L -L at cdc.gov. And now I'll turn the call back over to Alexandra. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Uh, you may submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You may also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar, and in today's email newsletter. Next slide. And lastly, before today's presentations, we'd like to conduct a few quick polls. We're always looking for ways to improve the Zohu call, so we would appreciate your participation. Um, if you have any specific suggestions or additional feedback you want to provide after the polls, please feel free to include it in your CE evaluation form or send to us via email at zohucall at cdc.gov. The polls should be available on your screen now. Um, if you cannot see the full answer choice, you can expand the size of the poll box. And if you'd like to provide any additional context to your answer choice, please feel free to put it in the evaluation form or send it to us via email. Okay, I'll give one more minute for the poll. Okay, we're going to close the poll now. Um, Again, if you have any additional feedback you'd like to provide, please feel free to include it in your evaluation form or via email to us. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, okay, today's first presentation, Companion Animals and Health, the Science of Human-Animal Interaction is by Dr. Megan K. Mueller. Uh, Megan, please begin when you're ready. Great, thank you so much for inviting me to present today. Um, my name is Megan Mueller and I am on the faculty at the Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. I am a developmental psychologist and I study the science of human animal relationships, uh, particularly focused around our companion animals that live in our homes with us. So today what I'm going to do is give a brief overview of how we approach understanding human animal relationships in the household setting. What are some of the considerations for doing research on human and animal health in human animal interaction? And give just a couple of brief examples of types of research methodologies that we use to address these questions. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Great, thanks. 
Um, so first I'd like to start out with what is human animal interaction? It's this really broad term that is used to describe many different ways that we interact with animals, whether that's pets and households, free roaming community animals, animal assisted interventions in therapeutic settings, human wildlife interactions. There's lots of different ways that we interact with animals. Um, but next slide. Today, we are going to focus on pets and households. So these are animals that live in or around our households. So why is it important to understand the role of companion animals in this one health model? Um, well, over two thirds of families in the United States have at least one pet and this rate's higher for families with children. And uh, these animals live in very close contact with us in our households, share our environments, and there's an impact on both human and animal health and well-being. Next slide, please. But studying these relationships is really complicated. It's not just an individual and their animal existing in isolation. There are many different variables we have to consider when we're measuring human and animal health correlates of human animal interaction. Whether that's the type of animal, the strength of the bond, the context of the relationship, all of that interacts with individual, cultural, and family attitudes and practices around animal care. And all of this links together to promote human and animal health. So we really have to look at the whole system when we're trying to understand how pets can contribute to human health. Next slide, please. So largely the question that was asked um, for many years in the research around human animal interaction was, are animals good for our health? Next slide. And I would argue that this is not a great question because there's a lot of variation in whether or not a pet in the home is going to be linked to human health. Next slide, please. So now we're focusing on a more nuanced question, which is what are the specific circumstances where human animal interaction is beneficial for the health of both people and the animals involved in the interaction? And this allows us to really identify how we can optimize those circumstances to promote health and really allows us to make more practical recommendations for public health outcomes. Next slide, please. So research on human-animal interaction, or HAI as it's often called, often focuses on these three areas. First, what are the outcomes for the people and animals involved um, in these relationships? What are the processes and mechanisms that drive these outcomes? And how do we identify conditions for success? How do we optimize human relationships with pets in the home to promote health for everyone involved? Next slide. And you can click through till these are all on. So some of the outcomes that have been studied most extensively in human-animal interaction are mental health, the role of pets in supporting um, human mental health, physical health, whether that is physical activity, such as dog walking or other physical health outcomes, animal welfare and animal stress is an area that's been explored more recently, how pets can contribute to community cohesion through social facilitation and building of social networks, and also public health in all sorts of domains, including zoonotic disease transmission. And these are just a few of the outcomes. If you search pets and health in PubMed, you'll, you'll see many, many, many research studies looking at many outcomes. However, there's this paradox that we see in HAI research, which is that the research findings are not always positive. There's this common public perception that pets are good for our health, but what we see is really a much more mixed picture in the research literature. Next slide, please. And that's what makes these next two questions so critical. So we need to understand what are the processes and mechanisms that would drive positive health outcomes associated with pets? And what are the conditions for success? Because this allows us to actually make programmatic and policy change in ways that will promote health for people and animals. So some of the questions that are being studied now in the HAI scientific literature are, what are the physiological processes that are underlying some of these interactions? For example, when we are, say, um, patting a dog, what is happening physiologically in terms of stress reduction um, and all kinds of other physiological correlates? Also looking at the different system level effects, um, the individual person and their animal, but also what's happening in the family system or the community system or the environment. How does animal behavior contribute to these outcomes? Animals are individuals just like we are, and they have different behaviors that might link to different health outcomes. 
and also individual human characteristics as well. Even something as simple as whether or not somebody likes an animal or um, is a prefers dogs or cats, these are all variables that impact the health outcomes. And then community resources as well. Do people have access to affordable veterinary care in their community? Do they have access to a secure food source? Uh, do they have green space to walk their dog? All of these community level resources are really important for understanding how we optimize this relationship for health. Next slide, please. So really what this involves is taking a systems approach to looking at human animal interaction, where we're looking not only at the person animal dyad, but also interactions with all the other systems that exist in someone's environment and how these systems play out over time. So what I'm going to do next is talk about the different, a few examples of different types of methodologies that we use to answer questions about different parts of this system. Next slide, please. The first study I'm going to talk about looks at individual human characteristics and community resources together in understanding sociodemographic patterns of pet ownership. Next slide, please. This study uses a methodology that is very common in human animal interaction, which is representative survey research. This is a more moderately sized um, study, but there are larger data sets as well that include pet ownership. And this type of methodology can help us understand more broadly patterns of who owns pets and why and what the systemic differences might be between different groups of folks and the benefits associated with pet ownership. So what we found in this study, among many other things, was that in America, people were more likely to have a pet if they lived in a one-family detached residence as compared to rental housing or multifamily housing. And that shows that there's a potential impact of affordable pet-friendly rental housing on whether or not someone can even have a pet if they wish to have one. They're also more likely to have a pet if they have children in the home and are currently employed, which also show some other sociodemographic patterns of who might choose to own pets and why, and also the role of economic constraints in pet ownership. Next slide, please. Then um, there are other ways that we can get at looking at system level effects and taking a deeper dive into individual characteristics. And the next study I'll mention uses a qualitative methodology where we do interviews with parents and teenagers about the, their relationships with pets in the family. Next slide, please. And next slide. Um, so in this particular study, we did in-depth interviews. And this is a different type of data that allows us to really, again, dive deep into what's actually happening in these households that might be related to health. So parents really, parents and teenagers both talked a lot about how pets can contribute to developing empathy skills, bonding with family and friends, encouraging kids to exercise and to spend less time sedentary and more physical activity, and can help provide emotional support, especially for emotion regulation during times of stressors. But also that there were challenges to having a pet in the home as well, whether that was family tension around taking care of the pet, um, whether that meant problematic animal behaviors where, um, for example, if your dog is aggressive towards other dogs, you might be less likely to have your child take that dog outside and go for a walk. Um, and some of these challenges exist alongside the benefits. And so this type of qualitative methodology is often used to uncover some of the actual family dynamics that are going on with pets that can contribute to health outcomes or not health outcomes. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, the last study I'm going to mention is one where we measure physiological processes and also animal behavior and individual human behavior on a more micro level. Next slide. Um, this study uses a methodology called ecological momentary assessment, which involves taking repeated measurements over the course of a day. It's more time intensive, asking participants, in this case teenagers, to report what they're actually doing with their dogs on a day-to-day -day basis. And we use um, an app that is designed to ping them at various times during the day, and they report what they're doing, whether they're interacting with other people, interacting with their dog. 
And then I also wear a wristband that collects physiology data that measures anxiety. And so we can see how their um, anxiety might be impacted by different types of interactions with their dog. Next slide. And so this is what it looks like when we collect this type of data is we can see how anxiety levels might be linked to different types of activities. So perhaps they're interacting with their peers and they're experiencing some anxiety along with that. But then we can see when they report interacting with their dog that there's decreases in anxiety. And then we're also layering onto this, what's the dog actually doing? What kinds of behaviors are happening? And so this type of methodology allows us to understand mechanisms that are we seeing a physiological response to a certain type of behavior or interaction with a dog. And that helps us identify what are the circumstances where they're interacting with the dog is having a positive impact on anxiety reduction. So those are just three very quick examples of very different types of research methodologies that we use to address this whole system of questions in human-animal interaction. And by using all these different methodologies, we can try to uncover some of the underlying pieces of the health benefits that might be associated with pets so that we can help promote those health outcomes. Next slide, please. So just to sort of sum all of this up, um, how do we translate all this research into actual practical application? Well, first of all, it's important to understand why people choose to get pets and do these factors relate to health outcomes? It's really hard to do a randomized control trial of pet ownership because people don't want to be told whether or not they have a pet. But these factors might impact health outcomes and we really have to grapple with that in the research. Understanding what the barriers are to pet ownership, whether that's affordable pet-friendly housing, discriminatory housing policies, availability of green space, some of these structural pieces that are crucial for pet ownership. Whether they're shared inequalities in human health care access and veterinary care access, that is a significant One Health challenge. And then what levels of intervention do we have? There's an opportunity to impact on both the individual, family, community, and policy level because of the ubiquity of pets in human life. But this really requires interdisciplinary collaboration among health professionals that have expertise in both human health and animal health. Next slide, please. Um, and the future of human-animal interaction research, we really have to continue to advance our use of cutting-edge methodologies to address all these different parts of the system. And this means adopting best practices from other fields of health research, for example, having more open science and transparency in our methods, but also exploring how these interactive behaviors between people and animals um, can promote health outcomes. And Furthermore, assessing human and animal health simultaneously. For a long time, human-animal interaction research focused almost exclusively on human health, but the health of the animals is really important to measure as well. And then really try to diversify the field across the research practice spectrum. Historically, a lot of human-animal interaction research has involved exclusively high socioeconomic populations, and we really need to understand the diversity of experiences that people have with animals and human health. Um, next slide. So thank you very much for inviting me today to talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions in the Q&A, as I know that was a very fast overview of a large area of research. So um, thank you again. Thank you so much. Uh, next is human infections with highly pathogenic avian influenza A, H5N1 virus uh, by Dr. Tim Uecki. Please start when you're ready. Uh, thank you. Next slide. I have no disclosures. Um, next slide. So what I'll try to do is cover some background on influenza A viruses and then start speaking about the virology of H5N1 viruses. We'll cover um, wild bird infections, poultry outbreaks, um, infections in mammals, uh, recent human cases, um, CDC preparedness activities, and um, public health risk assessment. Next slide. So a little background about influenza viruses of the four types of influenza viruses that have been identified to date, A, B, C, and D. We know that influenza A, B, and C viruses have infected people to cause disease. 
Um, influenza viruses have eight gene segments and they continue to evolve. Uh, we really pay most attention on uh, influenza A and B viruses because seasonal influenza A and B viruses cause annual epidemics uh, around the world. Um, although novel influenza A viruses attract our attention because it is only novel influenza A viruses that acquire the ability for sustained human to human transmission that can cause rare influenza pandemics. So influenza A viruses are more important than any of the other types of influenza viruses in terms of public health and agriculture. The natural reservoir for almost all influenza A viruses uh, is in wild waterfowl, particularly wild ducks and geese around the world. Uh, avian influenza A viruses are further classified as highly pathogenic. We refer to that as HPAI or low pathogenic. We refer to that as LPAI by molecular and pathogenicity criteria. There are formal criteria. Um, it is not whether viruses kill birds or not. So just be aware that there are formal criteria. And of note, pathogenicity in infected poultry does not necessarily translate, does not necessarily equal the pathogenicity in infected people with the same viruses. So influenza A viruses are further classified into subtypes based upon the antigenic characteristics of the two main surface proteins. We refer to them as the hemagglutinin, also the HA or H or the neuraminidase, the Na or N. The hemagglutinin is the most important um, surface glycoprotein because that is where the virus binds to host cell receptors. The neuraminidase is also important because um, the neuraminidase has um, several um, properties, but it also helps release viral particles from infected cells. And there's a class of antiviral drugs called the neuraminidase inhibitors that works to um, block the release of such variants from infected cells. Next slide, please. So um, there are 18 known hemagglutinin subtypes and 11 known neuraminidase subtypes. All of these, except for two, are found in wild birds. Um, H17N10 and H18N11 uh, have been identified in bats. Um, there are many different animal species that can be infected with different kinds of influenza A viruses. Uh, some of these influenza A viruses do circulate among um, animal species other than birds, including poultry and, uh, sorry, including pigs. Um, there are also other kinds of influenza A viruses that do circulate in other animal species. Uh, for from the public health perspective, we're really concerned about these sporadic avian to human or pig to human cases, which we uh, refer to as novel influenza A viruses. Um, and this has been reported with many different subtypes of influenza A viruses. There's two main um, ways that influenza A viruses evolve. One of them is through minor mutations to genes that result in changes to the virus proteins. Um, that is a process called antigenic drift. The other is actually exchange of genes, and we refer to that as genetic reassortment. Next slide. So this figure depicts um, the ecology of um, different types of influenza viruses. Um, just for this presentation, focus on the blue box, influenza A viruses, and you can just see a wide range of different animals, not just birds, but different kinds of, of mammals that have been infected with influenza A viruses. Um, this includes both terrestrial and marine mammals. Um, there are influenza viruses that circulate among horses, referred to as equine influenza A viruses. There are similar viruses that circulate among dogs um, that are referred to as canine influenza A viruses. So it's just a wide range. And humans have been sporadically infected with some of these viruses. Uh, that have circulated among birds and among pigs. Um, I won't go into other details. There have been some uh, cases of um, cat to human transmission of an avian-like um, low pathogenic H7 and 2 virus uh, in New York. Uh, next slide. So just to focus on uh, highly pathogenic uh, H5N1 viruses, um, the subtype actually uh, was first identified in 1959 during a poultry outbreak in Scotland, but we really um, 
you know, pay attention to uh, the viruses that um, are related to a virus that was identified in a goose from southern China, um, Guangdong province, so-called goose Guangdong 1996 virus. And since 1996, H5N1 viruses have evolved into distinct antigenic clades and subclades, uh, both by um, antigenic drift, but also by genetic reassortment. And um, the figure is just the, that you see on the right is just a phylogenetic tree. Um, it's pretty much unreadable, but the point is that it's just this huge diversification of H5N1 viruses that continues to occur. Um, since emergence um, or since identification in 1996, these highly pathogenic H5N1 viruses have continued to evolve. They've spread uh, by wild birds and migratory waterfowl and poultry um, from Asia throughout different regions of the world. And we saw more than 60 countries in which um, these viruses were spread to during 2004 to 2007, including in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And um, since then, there's been endemic circulation or enzootic spread among some poultry in some countries. Next slide. In recent years, there's been spread of this particular uh, clade that we refer to as 2.3.4.4b viruses um, since 2020. Uh, to many different regions of the world, including in late uh, 2021 and early 2022, spread to North America. And a wide, wide range of different wild birds have been infected, including um, predatory birds, scavenger birds, um, birds at the um, uh, coastal sea interface, um, both terrestrial as well as, well as uh, birds that are more like seabirds. And then what we've seen in um, uh, late 2022 into this year is spread for the first time uh, these viruses spread to South America. Um, just to make the point that not all birds are equally susceptible to high path H5N1 viruses. There are some duck species that can have asymptomatic infection, uh, can infect other ducks or other bird species, uh, but are perfectly well. Next slide. So this is um, uh, a map. Um, this figure is a map from FAO, which just shows since October of last year. Um, if you look at um, the red circles or um, the white circles where high path um, H5 viruses have been identified, it's most regions of the world you can see um, a, a lot of North America, uh, Europe, uh, but also into other regions of the world. Next slide. So um, since uh, early 2022, we have had 50 states or territories that have uh, identified uh, high path H5N1 viruses in wild birds. And so most of this was in 2022. Some of it has occurred in 2023, but it's, you know, it's certainly every state except for Hawaii, as far as I know. Uh, next slide. In terms of poultry outbreaks, we had a lot of poultry outbreaks last year, uh, both uh, in commercial flocks, but also backyard flocks. Um, what you see on the bottom left there is um, 47 states have reported outbreaks either in commercial or backyard flocks um, since the beginning of 2022. Uh, but the figure on the lower right is more recent. You can see just in the last 30 days, um, very, very uh, limited detections and uh, no poultry outbreaks have occurred for several months or at least been identified. Um, so the impact was much greater in the U.S. last year and continued on into early this year. Almost 59 million um, uh, birds have either uh, died or been uh, de called depopulated to control these outbreaks. Uh, next slide. So in terms of transmission to mammals, we've known since late 2023, or sorry, 2003, that um, uh, terrestrial mammals can be infected. Uh, tigers and leopards in a zoo in uh, Thailand were reported. Um, there are also reports in dogs and cats um, in early um, 2004. 
Um, more recently, cats um, since last year, and then you probably heard in the news or are seen in publications, um, you know, last year, a cat in France, and then some cats in the US this year, and more recently, a number of cats in Poland, and as well as South Korea, have been identified with H5N1 virus infection. It's all pretty much been this clade 2.3.4.4b virus. Um, um, presumably, this is after um, uh, the animals were either fed or consumed an infected um, uh, chicken um, or duck or came upon a wild uh, bird that died um, and a wide, wide range of mammals um, in the last few years, not just in the US or North America, but in many regions of the world, including small carnivores, but also very large uh, carnivores and scavengers, including uh, bears. Um, there have also been outbreaks I think people are aware of in farmed animals, particularly farm mink last year in Spain, more recently in the news, um, outbreaks in Arctic foxes in Finland. Um, those are a little different where you have animals um, that are raised for fur in very, very close quarters. Um, and that's really different, I think, in, the, in terms of wild animals. Uh, but also marine mammals have been infected. Um, including seals and sea lions. This has been reported off the coastal areas of New England, um, but also uh, in other areas of the world, including in South America, um, detections in porpoises and dolphins. It's unclear if mammal to mammal transmission has occurred. Um, colleagues uh, have published uh, about the outbreak in the US from last summer, late spring and last summer off the coast of New England and Harbor and Gray Seals. They, their conclusion was it was really environment to seal transmission and not seal to seal transmission. Um, there have been large outbreaks among sea lions in Peru. Um, it's, it's unclear if there's um, ongoing mammal to mammal transmission or just environment to um, uh, marine mammal transmission because of contamination from uh, shorebirds. Next slide. So just to say that uh, seasonal influenza A viruses that infect people and avian influenza A viruses that infect birds, but also spill over to animals um, have different receptor binding tropism. So uh, seasonal influenza A viruses circulating among people bind primarily to alpha 2,6 linked um, sialic acid receptors that are found primarily in the human upper respiratory tract, um, whereas avian influenza A viruses tend to bind to receptors bearing alpha-2,3 linked sialic acid receptors. We call those avian-like, and those are present in both the respiratory as well as the gastrointestinal tract of birds. So they're present in respiratory as well as gastrointestinal um, secretions, feces. And so, um, it's not completely the case that only uh, alpha-2,6 salic acid receptors are in the human upper respiratory tract, but we believe that in order to really um, increase the risk to public health, these viruses or any avian viruses would need to be able to bind more efficiently to uh, alpha-2,6 salic acid receptors in the upper respiratory tract of people, and we haven't seen that to date. Next slide. So just uh, a, a bit about human cases of H5N1 virus infections. The first human infections were identified in Hong Kong during an outbreak in 1997. First case was in May of 1997, followed by 17 other uh, cases identified in November and December that year, total of 18 cases and six deaths. There were some additional cases identified through serologic uh, studies. Uh, and then we didn't hear much, but then in early 2003, we heard about um, some cases in a family from Hong Kong who went to Southern China, Fujian province. Um, and then uh, in late 2003, in early 2004, there were cases identified in Vietnam and Thailand, and then further spread to other areas in, um, in cases in China, Southeast Asia. And then um, uh, as viruses were spread among wild birds and poultry, 
uh, to other regions of the world that were associated sporadic human cases, uh, also identified in other regions. And so since 2003, there have been about 878 cases with greater than 50% mortality reported in 22 countries. And if we go back to 1997, it's, it's, it's uh, almost 900 cases total. Um, my opinion is that probably uh, cases have been missed uh, along the whole spectrum from a mild to severe and some probably asymptomatic cases. There is a very wide, wide clinical spectrum. Most reported cases have had severe pneumonia uh, because most case finding has been based on um, hospitalized patients. There's been relatively few cases reported worldwide since 2016. Most cases uh, since 1997 have occurred through sporadic avian to human transmission from poultry exposures. There are a small number of cases with unknown sources of infection. One case, one example is a case that was imported in a traveler uh, who returned from China um, to um, Canada in late 2003, was hospitalized and died. And was it's a bit unclear um, the source of that uh, virus infection. Next slide. So we have um, observed clusters of epidemiologically linked cases um, in various countries. Most of these clusters represent common poultry exposures and family members. Um, I'll just say that there are two clusters of wild bird to human transmission from defeathering people who defeathered uh, dead wild swans that they found. That was in Azerbaijan in 2006. So um, it, it is possible to have wild bird to human transmission. Um, there have been a small number of clusters in a few countries in which probable limited non-sustained human to human transmission has occurred uh, among blood related family members. So what do I mean by that? I mean like a, a parent and a child or siblings. Um, this has been both second generation um, uh, chicken to human to human, and then dead end transmission, but two clusters of third generation. So chicken to human to human to human, and then stopped. So dead end transmission. There's been no cases of mammal to human transmission reported. It is theoretically possible, uh, but none have been reported to date. And um, we haven't had any cases of limited non-sustained human to human transmission reported since 2007 to my, aware, uh, to my knowledge. Um, risk factors for H5N1 virus infection include uh, direct and close unprotected exposure to sick or dead uh, infected poultry. Um, it, it's, it's typically um, exposure to backyard poultry, but it could also be by visiting a live poultry market where infected birds um, are slaughtered. There may be aerosolization of a material with a virus present that that's then inhaled into the lower respiratory tract. Uh, but these cases, again, remain rare. Um, in the cases where there's been limited human-to-human uh, -human transmission, it's, it's, it's not been through casual contact. It's been through prolonged, unprotected close exposure to a symptomatic case, typically in households, but it's also occurred in hospitals. Next slide. So this is an epidemic curve of cases since 1997, human cases, uh, 22 countries, almost 900 cases. What you can see is, is really some uh, periodicity, some seasonality uh, in the peaks of cases. And we have really had very few cases since 2015. Most of those cases in 2015 were um, uh, identified and reported in Egypt. And you can see cases have really tailed off since then. Next slide. So um, just to say briefly about testing, um, there are commercially available influenza assays um, in clinical settings. These do not specifically identify H5N1 virus. Basically you get a positive test for influenza A virus. You cannot distinguish uh, um, a positive uh, result for seasonal influenza A from novel influenza A. Uh, including H5N1 virus. So what you need to do is have respiratory tract specimens sent to public health laboratories. That's generally at state public health laboratories. Some large um, city public health laboratories may have capacity. And then um, there needs to be subtyping of influenza A viruses. And then um, uh, state health, most state health departments can run the CDC H5 
primer probe set. If H5 is positive, then we need the specimen to come to CDC right away for confirmation. Uh, next slide. So just to say, because of the potential for close large, close range large droplet and small particle or aerosol spread, and because H5N1 virus infection of humans is associated with high mortality, we do recommend standard contact airborne uh, precautions with single use gown gloves, eye protection, as well as fit tested N95 respirator uh, or higher level of respiratory protection and ideally uh, management of a patient in an airborne infection isolation room that has negative pressure and HEPA filtration. Next slide. Um, in terms of clinical management, the hallmark really is antiviral treatment. Um, we recommend oseltamivir started empirically as soon as possible for patients with suspected H5N1 virus infection. Uh, based on a history of exposures, we do recommend oseltamivir treatment as soon as possible for any hospitalized patient. Um, for patients who are hospitalized, um, we do recommend considering a longer duration of treatment. For patients who are, who are not hospitalized, we do recommend standard oseltamivir dosing twice daily for five days. Um, the good news is that um, worldwide, when we look at viruses circulating in wild birds, uh, viruses that have infected poultry uh, or infected um, mammals or humans, we don't see markers of resistance to uh, recommended and approved FDA-approved uh, FDA antivirals. That could change, and so we clearly need surveillance for that. Um, and really, clinical management, which is not the focus of this talk, um, I can talk about that in much greater detail um, if, if people are interested, but really it's just supportive care of complications. We don't have any clinical trials uh, of any interventions for H5N1 patients, including antiviral treatment. The recommendations for oseltamivir treatment are based upon observational studies, as well as uh, studies for seasonal influenza. But in general, uh, earlier treatment is associated with greater survival versus later initiation of treatment. Next slide. So the current situation, um, since uh, early 2022 to date, there have been more than 6,500 persons in the U.S. who have been monitored following poultry or wild bird exposures, uh, either to confirmed uh, H5N1 infected birds or suspected more than 160 people have reported symptoms and been tested, and um, only one person uh, has had H5N1 virus detected in their respiratory specimens, and that individual only reported fatigue. I'll just comment on that in, in just a minute. So to date, since the beginning of 2022 worldwide, there have been 15 cases reported uh, to WHO from eight different countries. Almost all of them have had poultry exposures. There's uh, been some cases in which it was uh, unclear what the exposure was, um, but um, six of these cases have been severe, including two deaths. Two were mild, and uh, there are seven asymptomatic cases. So let me just um, kind of go over some of these cases. So what I've highlighted in red there are cases that it's unclear, um, at least to me, whether these represent true infection. So one case is uh, detected in late December, 2021, and was reported in January, 2022. It was a 80 year old gentleman who raised uh, ducks in England. Um, he had viral RNA detected at a low level on three different days. Uh, he never developed symptoms. Um, the one person in the US who had H5N1 viral RNA detected in an upper respiratory tract specimen that was in Colorado in April of last year. That was an individual involved in culling of poultry from a confirmed um, H5N1 poultry outbreak, only reported fatigue. One specimen um, uh, with, was identified with very low level of viral RNA. Uh, there were two cases in Spain uh, in the fall of last year, uh, asymptomatic poultry workers also responding to poultry outbreaks confirmed H5N1. 
um, Spanish colleagues have published a report on that. Their conclusion was that uh, that the detection of those two cases, which was low viral RNA levels, represented likely represented environmental contamination. Um, this year, there have been um, four other cases reported from the UK in poultry workers responding to um, confirmed H5N1 poultry outbreaks, all asymptomatic, um, low viral levels, viral RNA levels. Um, it's a bit unclear whether those represent true infection or not. My suspicion is the bulk of those asymptomatic cases um, are attributable to transient detection of viral RNA at low levels and not true infection. Uh, I can't prove that though, but I'm um, doubtful that the, they, those asymptomatic cases or the US case last year actually represented true infection, yet they met criteria for reporting to WHO under the international health regulations. And I think that was very appropriate to report all those cases. I'll say that there are uh, cases of true asymptomatic H5N1 infection that I am aware of um, that have been confirmed both virologically and serologically. I think convincing evidence that asymptomatic virus infection can occur. And because these viruses continue to evolve, we do want to know whether or not there's an increase in asymptomatic infections or mild cases. Um, next slide. So at CDC, um, some, I'll just highlight some of our preparedness activities, but just to say that these are not new. We're always doing this, and we do this for all uh, novel influenza A viruses of public health importance. Um, and we've been doing this for H5 um, for decades. So we support laboratory testing and confirmation of any human respiratory specimens with H5 viral RNA detected in the US or worldwide. We do confirm uh, um, uh, cases in, from other countries. We are WHO um, reference center for influenza. Um, so we do support the Americas but we do receive uh, specimens and viruses from around the world. So we do support global surveillance of avian influenza A viruses and poultry and people at the animal health interface. We analyze and characterize avian influenza A viruses, identify from birds, other animals, and people worldwide. That includes antigenic genetic characterization as well as antiviral susceptibility testing. Um, we are always working on uh, developing H5 candidate vaccine viruses. Uh, and we do share those uh, candidate vaccine viruses with vaccine manufacturers. So it's all part of preparedness in the event there were to be an H5N1 uh, pandemic. We do assess uh, the pandemic potential of H5N1 viruses circulating in wild birds and poultry um, and that have infected mammals as well as people. We use the CDC Influenza Risk Assessment or IRAT tool. Um, you can look that up. We've uh, recently updated and posted uh, an assessment of clade 2.3.4.4B viruses. Next slide. So in summary, um, these clade 2.3.4.4B H5N1 viruses are circulating in wild birds and poultry in many regions of the world. There's been sporadic spillover to mammals and rare sporadic human infections. There are some other clades of H5N1 viruses in circulation among poultry and wild birds in some countries, but the 2.3.4.4B viruses are predominant worldwide. Um, these viruses appear that they're well adapted to infect and spread among wild birds and also go from wild birds to poultry. Um, sporadic spillover to mammals is not surprising. We've known about this since at least 2003, um, but there is no evidence of sustained transmission of these viruses among any mammal species that I'm aware of. There's never been any instances of mammal to human transmission, and nearly all sporadic human cases reported since 2022 had exposure to poultry. That also includes going back to 1997. There's no indication of human to human transmission. Um, but I, I think we should expect additional sporadic human infections with these viruses. We should expect these viruses to continue to evolve. We should continue to expect spillover to different 
mammal species worldwide, wherever these viruses are circulating in wild birds. And because they're spread in migratory waterfowl, um, although um, circulation has been low in poultry um, right now uh, or in recent months, that could change again in the fall as the birds come back from the northern regions of Canada and head south. Um, H5N1 viruses lack the ability to bind well to receptors in the human upper respiratory tract, and they lack the ability to spread efficiently among people. So overall, we think the public health risk is low, but because these viruses continue to evolve, uh, we believe that vigilance and ongoing monitoring is needed uh, for these viruses in animals and people worldwide. Next slide. Well, just to say that the focus of this talk has been on high path H5N1 viruses. There are many other avian influenza A viruses, different subtypes that have caused human infections, both low pathogenic as well as highly pathogenic, both to cause mild uncomplicated disease as well as severe disease, including fatal uh, outcomes. So it's not just H5N1 viruses that have uh, are of public health importance. Next, next slide. Um, and I'll just also say that um, these are a number of resources that we have on our CDC web pages. At the very bottom is a, a link to our uh, recent update of the CDC H5N1 technical report. Um, I'll just also say that we now are in the agricultural fair season in the US, state and county agricultural fairs where swine are exhibited. Um, a lot of kids exhibit swine. Um, we have had sporadic variant influenza virus infections. That, that's uh, what we refer to as a, a swine influenza A virus infection of a human. We call that a variant virus infection. We have had sporadic infections and um, there is, uh, and Michigan has reported a presumptive case um, that has occurred uh, very, very recently. And, and so, it's not just avian viruses that um, are of concern in terms of uh, animal to human transmission of influenza A viruses. So I'll just stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much to Dr. Mueller and Dr. Uecki for their presentations. Um, we have time for just a few very quick questions. Um, Megan, first two for you. Um, is is there any tracking system for dog bites or attacks? And then the second question is, could you elaborate on um, slide 27 where it says regulate emotions after screen events? Sure, so um, in terms of dog bites, uh, the short answer is no, um, dog bites are not tracked effectively in any true unified way. There's different ways of getting at um, that data, but it, it all depends on whether it's reported or not through a healthcare provider. Um, but there's definitely a need for additional bite prevention programs, certainly as a component of Pets in One Health. Um, to answer the question about emotion regulation and screen time, that's really around um, when teenagers in particular have negative interactions online. Um, in many different forms and the they report that their pets can help them regulate after that type of stressful event often through distraction or um, just comfort thank you um tim the next couple are for you um does the decrease in bird detections of H5N1 recently portend a coming end to the current um, outbreak in the US? I don't think we know. It's a great question. Um, but because it's wild birds spreading this virus around um, and uh, particularly migratory birds, um, I don't think we know. And so I think let's see what happens as uh, birds uh, uh, come south um, from Canada uh, later this um, late summer in, into the early fall. Um, and, you know, whether this becomes endemic in wild birds in the U.S., it's uh, a bit unclear. Some people think it is. Some, I think it's, it's not quite clear yet. But if it is, does become endemic um, in wild birds, then I think then um, uh, poultry outbreaks will continue to uh, occur, or at least the, there will be that potential. 
Thank you. And just last question, um, what, if any, overlap has been seen with avian and bat sequences? Well, that's a great question. Um, I guess my first response would be, I don't know, but I'm not aware that there's been any um, overlap at all in the the um, uh, the two subtypes of influenza A viruses that have been identified in bats are very, very different than um, avian influenza A viruses. And so um, we don't, at least from the influenza perspective, we don't typically um, do any surveillance among bats um, for influenza A viruses. We're not really focused on bats. We're more concerned about many, many other animals, uh, particularly birds. Um, but it's it's a very interesting question. So I, I, I'm not sure I can answer it other than that. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Um, thanks again to both of our presenters today for some really great presentations. This is all the time we have for questions, but if you have additional questions, um, we've included their email addresses here um, on the Zohu Call webpage and in today's email newsletter. A video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days and links to additional resources on these topics are available on our website on our August Zohu Call page. Um, next slide. And please join us for our next Sohu call on September 6th. Thank you everyone for your presentation or for your participation and for the great presentations. This ends today's webinar.